Omari King Wise Barksdale, an activist involved in a multitude of activities and programs, has been called upon to provide his voice as a speaker, poet, and ally. Since emerging as one of Detroit's more preeminent performance artists in 2001, Omari has held the attention of audiences across the country, including representing Detroit, Michigan as a member of seven National Poetry Slam teams, 2008 Grand Slam champion, and the 2007 Rust Belt Championship Slam team. I'm Rosemarie Wilson, aka One Single Rose, your host of Ready, Set, Flow, and we are here at Trilla Soaps in Detroit at 146. For Gratiot Avenue, close to downtown Detroit, right across from the Eastern Market. If you up on that, you know what that is. On Saturday morning, you come down here and get your fresh produce and everything. We are here to interview Omari King Wise at the Urban Echo Poetry Slam. They're going on right now. We got some amazing poets. We got some amazing people on the open mic. We got vendors. Come on in and let's hear what's going on. Ready, set, flow. What up though, Ready, Set, Flow? We are here at Trina Soaps in Detroit, Michigan, 1464 Gratiot at the Urban Echo Poetry Slam with Omari King. Why? Yes, what yes, up, yes. Though? What up though? How you doing I'm today? I'm great, I'm great. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your slam. The slam is going on right now. There's a lot going on. The slam is going on. There's open mic and he is the host of this series once a month here in Detroit, Michigan. Tell us what what prompted you to bring this back to to Detroit? So uh, I'm the oldest, uh, as you can see, I'm the <laughs> oldest um, poetry slam artist in the city as far as uh, still being active. Mm -hmm. So there is a team that goes on right now that uh, Justin Rogers and Deontay Osiande do. Mm -hmm. uh, I figured there were enough poets now that are starting to be interested in slam again and so much talent out that um, you know, we just deserved another team in Detroit. So, so many poets would be sidelined, but they get an opportunity to go to the National Poetry Slam uh, in August, which will be in the Atlanta area this year. So I really just want to give more poets opportunity to see what helped me develop, helped me grow, and what inspires me. And you are a slam champion. You are a slam poet. Tell us about all that. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I've been a champion here in Detroit. Um, part of the 2007 Rust Belt uh, Poetry Slam team, which was the first Detroit team to ever win that competition. Okay. Um, and I've won a whole lot of slams, <laughs> and I've lost quite a few slams. Uh -huh. So it's, it's been a, a beautiful experience because I've been able to meet people and grow from what I what I get to hear whenever I go out and get in a slam, and somebody new inspires me. So. It's been great. And you've been performing poetry and slamming for over 10 years, mm -hmm. and you are still learning and growing and inspired by other poets. Oh, absolutely. Who are some of the poets here in Detroit that actually inspire you to write and push your pen even harder? Well, um, there are a few. Uh, you know, Dominique Boyd, mm -hmm. amazing poet. Uh, Deontay Oseande and Eric D. Matthews yourself and uh, Untitled and just Chris Jones, Untitled, amazing poet, uh, Valencia, Noomi Vanner, just, it's, it's just a lot of poets. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, I used to hide boogers at the bottom of my bed for Sometimes we they would dry and fall to the floor beneath where G.I. Joe was occasionally subject to salty onslaughts that no kung fu grip could have ever prepared me for. Even the wall behind my bed was a mucus based rendition of Starry Night. In a time when my little sister made me upset, I would snatch a pack of greens, brown peppers from the wall, and force her to eat my famous booger juice. She was so irritated. It was so poetic. One day, my mother was uncharacteristically cleaning under her bed, my bed when she was startled by the sound of a loud 1979 American barrel rotary telephone. She abruptly raised her hand, hit the side of her face on the bottom of the frame. As she rose to her feet, she realized her cheek was bleeding profusely, looked under the bed and discovered the booger zone. The membrane graveyard. Upon what just happened, she and the family decided to have a booger incident. They asked questions like, how long has this been going on? We know it's not your fault, but where have we failed you? Who taught you this? Who taught you this? I looked at my brother and I said, you, you 
hide your rocks and socks, comprise the death, despair, and destruction, slaying chemical then the construction materials to the living dead, and to you that were just hands to someone else that were hands of household. And I think you knew that. That's why you hid your product to my sister, Sandy Buxton. And I had to hide the fact that she didn't have it from last week. She just finally can't stop and thought it was candy. And you, Dad. You for hiding your smeared on the bottle behind the garage or slapping the bumper that broken down car and forcing me at the age of nine to help you hide that body you just shot in the head over $20. And you, Mom, you for acting like you didn't see what the hell was going on because you always hide from confrontation. So you put on this very proper facade and try to shield us from the truth. And I'm so confused because my entire life I've been told that life's a bitch and the truth hurts and what you don't know won't hurt you. But the truth is, life ain't a bitch. It's more like a family, full of love, yet full of happiness, full of sorrow, and full of madness. So teach me not to hide, mama. Teach me how to stand in the light even when I'm nervous. Teach me that soiled hands can be cleansed, and even shame is temporary. Teach me how to convert my worst to my best, even when I have to cry, my beautiful eyes open. Because my entire nasal cavity has been excavated, and so is my soul. And all I'm going to do is give life one big ass sneeze. Break my insecurities and impurities across the room. Let them land where they may. I encourage everybody to flip yours too. Let's have one big little fight. Let's go to war. Because we're not hiding our stuff anymore. Focus. The state or quality of having or producing clear definition. Focus One Entertainment is the premier videography company in the Midwest. We specialize in weddings, corporate events, documentaries, sporting events, and films. Regardless of the scope or budget, we approach every project the same way, by capturing and clearly defining your vision. Contact us at 313-444-3638 or www.focusoneentertainment.com. You have cultivated so many different poetic minds. Who are some of the poets that you, you workshop regularly, correct? Mm -hmm. Are you still doing that? I do still workshop uh, periodically, mm -hmm. not as much as I would like to, but um, you know, somebody I grew with, Shante Legacy Leonard, yeah. who is yeah. just one of my favorite writers of all time, and we don't have her with us anymore, but her presence always works through me in the workshops as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Jasmine Parks. Yes, yeah, she's uh, right. Oh, wow. Just, Brandy Foster, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, these are poets, Deontay, these are poets that I work with in my workshop and they just, you see them, and it's, it's, it's some others too, not just them, but you see them grow in the spot and it's like, it's like watching a son being born, it's, it's amazing, it's amazing. And you have been on the scene for so long. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of poetry here in Detroit? Where did it start? I hear so much about Cafe Mahogany, and I'm so mad that I was not on the scene then, because just the stories and the nostalgia and everything that came out of there. Tell us about poetry here in the day. So, actually, we got going a little bit more before Mahogany. Uh, I wasn't there for that part of Cafe uh, for me. Cafe and Cafe Aroma, I came around at Mahogany okay. and I was a spectator and that's why I did my first poem mm -hmm. uh, back in 98 or 99. Um, we transitioned through great venues like the Key Club with Sparrow as the host, uh, Cassie Poe and Ben Jones had Chameleon Cafe, um, but actually Cafe Mahogany, uh, Joe, also known as Fluent, yeah. um, and Kari Kamani Turner and Natural, they were all, and a couple other people hosted that actual venue. Uh, great and rich history. So many great talents came out of that venue. 
and went on to open other venues and went on to workshop and develop other artists. And you really have to, you really have to mention Aurora. Absolutely. When you talk about this, because she was so instrumental in so many of those artists, Jessica Caremore, Ben Jones, uh, Blair, you know, she was so instrumental in the development of these artists uh, that to me, when you talk about the history of poetry in Detroit, it goes before that. But to me, for my evolution, for what I've experienced, it's been Aurora that has been the center point of all of that. And Aurora Harris is with the Broadside Lotus Press. Well, Broadside just recently merged with Lotus Press, so it's two powerful publishing houses all in one. Oh, yeah, right let's there. not get started on the history of Broadside. Man, it's a that's deep, so... rich history. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> now, tell us about the Picnap pick Poetry Series. I've heard so much about that. I miss that, man. It's like, <laughs> that was the first place I slammed. Okay. So I was on the 2016 that Kalima Lock Mama Johnson, who's also the founder of Sasha Center, which is an organization I work with uh, for sexual assault services, holistic healing and awareness. Um, Kalima had this effect on people that made this venue, this series, so mighty and so amazing. But every night it was just packed and shoulder to shoulder. People missed each other like they hadn't seen each other in months and they were just shoulder to shoulder last week. Oh wow. Um, and then she did big events at the Max Fisher DSO mm -hmm. and she would some nights get two, three hundred people in there. It was wow. just it was just powerful and the slams and Starbucks sponsored it. Mm -hmm. So I used to work hard to win every slam because they gave fifty dollars <laughs> of Starbucks money to get. So I used to pay my manager in Starbucks money. So uh, <laughs> but it was just it was a great series, um, and it, it helped, really, really helped me to develop and expose me to the national artists, artists that I know on the slam scene, because prior to that, I was just going to the national black open mic venues or doing the college circuit, which pays well, but the energy and, and experiences you get from slam venues and slam artists is a little bit different. It gives you to me, it's a little, it feeds you a little bit more. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Crack smoke in the halls and the walls contain stains of fish. All that remains is ill fame in this abyss. I think the days of stick balls, spit balls, and keep on up days in the maze of quicksands and fit so fit balls, and it's all blasting me at the same time. I used to escape and relate to crime, but being black has a knack of sometimes depressing me, not the fact that I'm black, but society is stressing me and testing me and lessens me with the act of imagination, trying to kill this black man with a plan for assassination. You see samples. Can't comprehend the theory of a third eye being open. Too many caught up in the shuffle and gin. Stuck in a sin that can only comprehend what can shot to men of African lens. Paralyzed and tunnel racist. Loving all of mankind's races except his own. Can't accept his own for the cradle to the grave who disrespects his own. The ignorant living in cities where the wind blows, bullet holes from souls. Young minds that grows and close and cleans and spiral and from holes marching through the marsh. A kettle like zombies in a degraded flick. Living life slick and turning tricks in a degraded mix with the streets of Ethan. Can't wait to catch a young brother sleeping and inject HIV in the system that's creeping. So I, I choose to split the juice of the truth to the youth of the chosen tribe. So I should serve and subscribe to describe the life that God describes. And as I spit this, I try harder every day to live this and you might touch me. But I'm my own worst critic. See, I don't want to be a preacher. I want to be a little short and a street teacher. A young brother that's meant to be blind with you. A contract with the devil with you. Because my heart pumps nothing but love for my people, the down and out, the forgotten and lost, those who pay the cost for racist conservatives to be comfortable and wealthy, and the price my children pay is being hungry, miseducated, and unhealthy, diabetic, land poisoned, and asthmatic attack with into the pimping pastors, alcoholics, and crack addicts, and they attend schools with very few books and supplies, and the books they do have possess nothing but lies, and at noon they consume the food of doom and wash it down with sour milk inside of roach infested rooms, living in symbols of marginalism and mediocrity. But to be, this is genetic hypocrisy. So the engineer ignorant, become fathers and mothers, committing criminal acts of conception under the of your covers, raising tomorrow's nine leaders on hood plantations, sweat equity, never paid in reparations. This is a sad ass nation. I pour gasoline libations. I hope the soul of America is purified and granted reincarnation. Wake up and smell the carnations. 
Black Steel is still under free labor arbitration. In fact, we still auction on blocks with the new name is incarceration. They call this unchanged melody, but they have changed it to our melody. Create ill change and call us fellas to keep our community fellas. That's why crack rocks keep selling and the house people keep telling us stories of Kool-Aid stained chicken grits and water bottles. Because we zombies. With no real grave to live in. Keep using false imagery on our knees, praying all the time. Our children are sipping the zombie juice, waiting to get zombie noose on the web of the zombie noose. Coon shucking and jiving, equating raw sex with privacy, life can be handsome and be positive about it. That sample stuff, I'm tired of seeing it. Just like I'm tired of us being it. I want you to take the guy out of prison and you are free so we can bring it home with these specialized urban homes for those that roam with mental forbidden zones. It's time to escape and raise a ball before it's too late. Time to live life and not wait for an outside of fate. Change the culture in you. Eliminate the vultures in you. When times get hard, stay true and when question, ask yourself. And I don't know if I've ever thought about what I want my legacy to be. Um, You're already doing it, though. I mean, I can uh, I can tell you the answer, but I want you to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to, whether people mention my name or not, I would like to be a part of something that helps to cultivate and develop new artists to be better than the previous generation, more effective, stronger messengers. Um, in, a, in a stronger community and each group and poetry generations are like every four or five years so each generation could get better and stronger and when the world looks at Detroit they say that's where I want to go first to hear my poetry mm -hmm. yeah. wow that's deep that's deep but you, you are already leaving your legacy and your imprint and you are an avid supporter and an avid an avid uh, you are an avid supporter and an avid um, advocate for poets here in the city. And, and that alone in itself and what you're doing for the community is very, very, very needed. Well, I and love I thank, yeah, I mean, I thank I you because I'm still a baby. And <laughs> you were one of the first people that I heard at um, Define Your Legend. 
at the Charles H. Wright oh, wow. in 2010, yeah. November 2010. That was my Ooh. first time hitting the stage and I heard you and I saw your dress. <laughs> and I tapped you on the shoulder when you walked by. I don't know if you remember, but I gave you like a, like, you know, like man, this is so dope. I want to do that one day. <laughs> I probably don't remember. I don't remember my poems anymore. My mind is I'm just getting old. Yeah, that was five years ago, <laughs> too. So, <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> But you yeah. get it back, but Thank you, you. you do your thing. So where can we find you? Uh, overall, Mac and B-Wick. Uh, yeah, no, just, yeah, <laughs> yeah, downtown. No, um, as, as you know, you can find me here uh, on certain Wednesday nights of the month, once a month. Yes. 1464 Grasson, as you've mentioned. Uh, but you can find me on Facebook, Omari Barksdale. Uh, which is my government name, unfortunately, for his Facebook made me use the government name. Um, you can catch me on Instagram, Omari3EO. The 3EO stands for Third Eye Open, which is the name of my poetry group that I started off with. Uh, we're still going and still rocking. So Omari3EO on Instagram. Um, and for email, OmariPoetry at gmail.com. And you're spelling Omari, O-M-A-R-I. That's correct. Thank you so if you don't much. want to get slapped, you'll spell that way. <laughs> <laughs> you can cut that. Don't edit it. You can edit it. Don't edit it for it. <laughs> um, would you like to bless us with a shot? Uh, yeah. Crack smoke in the halls and the walls contain stains of piss. All that remains is ghetto fame in this abyss. I think of days of stickball, spitball, and kickball. And I'm dazed and amazed at quicksands and pitfalls, and it's all blasting me at the same time. I used to escape and relate through crime, but being black has a knack of sometimes depressing me. Not the fact that I'm black, but society be stressing me and testing me. Unless it's me with an active imagination trying to kill my black ass with a plan. Omari, King Rags, Daddy Sweet. Born and raised on the west side of Detroit, author, activist, and poet Natasha T. Miller is the ultimate reflection of where words meet action. She is Detroit poetry. Hey, what up, though? We are here at Manila Bay Cafe, Ready, Set, Flow with T. Miller. How you doing tonight? Good, how are you? Awesome. She is featuring here tonight on the Good Grief Tour with Sierra Freeman. We're going to talk to her in a few moments, but I'd like to thank you so much for coming out to share your talent. You are touring the world with the spoken word. Tell us a little bit about what you have going on with the Good Grief Tour. So basically what happened is myself and Sierra decided that in the black communities we don't properly deal with grief or deal with grief at all. Most times we don't acknowledge it. So we as two grieving women from the Midwest decided to, two grieving black women, decided to link up and kind of travel the world and teach people how to deal with grief through innovative ways. My side of the tour was inspired by me losing uh, my, my brother and Ciara's side of the tour was inspired by her losing her father. Those are personal losses but outside of that just every black community, every black person that we've lost um, has inspired this tour. Yeah, and there's so much of that going on. It's been going on for centuries, but it's just becoming so prevalent, especially with the social media. How has social media changed the way that we see ourselves? Well, I, don't, I don't know if it's changed the way that we see ourselves. I think it's just changed the way that we see everything. It's just provided a lens for us to see ourselves and other people where it used to just be us. It used to just be our communities. Now we're connected to so many communities at once, to so many other people at once, to so many other versions of ourselves at once. And that's how social media has kind of like shaped the generation, you know? Um, as much good as, as it does, it does bad. But um, I'm kind of, excited to see where we're going to move forward in the next few years with social media and the platform that for change it is created for us. And you are definitely using your platform with the spoken words. You are a slam champion. You are a crafty scholar. You've been in print and on television and you're touring the world giving us these powerful words. What actually got you started doing the spoken words? To be honest, one night I just kind of wrote a poem and it's the most basic story ever and I read it to a friend and that friend said that's really good you should actually go out and perform poems and I went out to like a few open mics and people liked me and I was like well maybe I should do this more often and then after like a couple years people start paying me and I was like well maybe I should do this all the time um, so to be honest like I, I, I didn't grow up like uh, in spoken word classes or didn't have any spoken word mentors I kind of just like fell into my passion which was like a great thing. 
they say you shouldn't mourn over the death of a drug dealer. Mm. Uh. They say the drug dealer stood on the tracks their whole lives, challenging the train. They say the drug dealer died uh. so casual. They say, what's his name's child on Joy Road or Rosa Parks was murdered and cold blood on his front porch? They say his, they don't say his name. They don't sympathize with the death of a drug dealer unless he was their drug dealer. Yeah. Gave them free drugs, paid their rent once, yeah. got their lights on, gave their kids a Christmas. They don't give the drug dealer a backstory or a reason why they're not surprised and don't understand why you are either. They say he purchased the engraving. So of course the bullets had his signature on them. They say his, they don't say his name they say his funeral is next week yeah. they say his funeral had a line the length of his rap sheet curled around the corner they say he must have been popular probably could have been somebody don't talk about who he actually was they yeah. say they say his mother was nice Come they on. say his casket was nice yeah. was burying her only son and still had enough strength to stand outside the church and laugh with uh, his niggas they say his niggas they don't say his name they treat it like a weight their fragile tongues are too weak to Hold, don't want to make mm, the mistake yeah. of humanizing yeah. the drug dealer. Yeah. So they'll show you his chalk outline long before showing you his picture. I say, yeah. I say his. I say his gray sweats are still on a hanger in my closet. His cologne still on my dresser. I say his. I yeah. say it's been 777 days since my brother was murdered and yeah. I haven't said his name once. I say my brother in every home and every status and conversation since his death. I say his death. I say his afraid the more times I say his name the quicker I'll empty myself of his memories I mm. say I say that I'm scared of remembering what his name tastes mm. like afraid that it'll fall like ashes and my mouth get buried underneath my tongue turn my lips into a headstone that forces me to talk about him. Come on, I'm his to say his name to say Marcus to say Marcus to say my brother his name is Marcus focus the state or quality of having or producing clear definition. Focus One Entertainment is the premier videography company in the Midwest. We specialize in weddings, corporate events, documentaries, sporting events, and films. Regardless of the scope or budget, we approach every project the same way, by capturing and clearly defining your vision. Contact us at 313-444-3638 or www.focusoneentertainment.com. By following your passion, it's it's basically paying off for you. You're compensated as you travel the world and you are mentoring with students and you're touching so many people and I just lost my train of thought, but this is video, so that works. <laughs> so you're touring the world with your words and touching so many people. How has that actually helped you deal with your grief? Well, it provides a platform for me to, to share my grief, for me to tell my story, but then I meet, I feel less alone because I meet other people that I inspire to tell their story. So, you know, if I'm on stage and I'm talking about, I lost my brother, when that poem is over, a woman might come to me and say, oh, I lost my brother, and then we hug, and then we exchange stories, and then we both feel like we're not alone in this world, we're not alone in other ways. So, you know, without this platform, I'm not sure if I would have found a way to, like,
I think the Detroit poetry scene over the last eight years has, has had its ups, has had its downs, but most importantly has had its ups. Um, I think it's, it's created an avenue for poets to actually be successful poets. I think that maybe eight or nine years ago, we just had like these small open mics and we were kind of just performing for each other. And that's not to, to negate like what was happening before um, eight or nine years ago, because there was a, a, a wave of Detroit poetry that was really, really big. But now there's actually an avenue for Detroit poets to become successful poets. So I think right now, like what's what's happening in the city, is kind of like the network. It's the place to be if you want to be any type of artist. But I think that over the last like eight or nine years, I've seen poetry in Detroit grow. I've seen organizations come to Detroit to get poets. I've seen poets become very And who are some of your favorite poets? In Detroit, yeah, like because you know, on any given night, like my favorite poet changes. You know, like I'll go somewhere and I'll hear a poem from Omari, it'll be my favorite poet, and I'll go and I hear a poem from Toriano, it'll be my favorite poet, or from Phoenix. So I don't really think you, I can pick, like, um, wait, the various. Yeah, there's a lot of talent here. Yeah, Everybody yeah. that I've heard since I've been on the scene is dope, got their own flavor, and they doing it big. So we're gonna bring Sierra in and talk to her. We are here with Sierra Freeman on the Good Grief Tour. Thank you so much for coming out to share your talent with us. I can't wait to hear you. I'm so excited. Thank you for having me. Yes, we had a, a brief conversation earlier and you told me something that was profound when someone tells you that they're proud of you. Can you tell us what that is? Because that just stuck with me now, but I want them to hear. Um, so, uh, as I've been touring and I've been doing this consistently since I was 14. When black women tell me that they're proud of me, it's a direct reflection of my grandmother and my mother because I know at 25, what I'm doing right now is not something my mother could do when she was 25, was not something my grandmother could do when she was 25. They sacrificed a lot of their dreams. My mother wanted to be a professional dancer. My grandmother liked to paint. They both are nurses now and they enjoy that job, but that wasn't their dream and they sacrificed so that I could live my dream as a writer and a performer. And every time a black woman tells me she's proud of me, I hear my mother and my grandmother saying, good job. And your words speak so much power and you're very profound. How long have you been doing poetry? Um, I started writing when I was seven. I wrote a poem for my grandmother. Um, and then when I was 14, I found slam poetry. Uh, a guy came to my high school and was talking about it, and we had a competition, and I actually won the competition. And so they brought me down, and we went to San Jose, California, for the big competition, and I haven't stopped since. Okay, okay. can't stop, won't stop. No, nope. mm -mm. can't do it. It's all I know that I'm good at for sure. So why stop? What you know? And you have poetry collections. I do. Um, I'm actually a manuscript. An entire manuscript is coming out of Bexley uh, University. Um, it's going to be coming out, I believe, in March of this year. Um, it's called Urban Girl Series, so far, tentative title. Okay. Um, and it's just a collection, basically, of all the works that I've done so far to date. And it's basically almost an autobiography at this point. I mean, what little autobiography you can make at 25. This is my life thus far. Hey, that's right. That's all right. You've lived, and you're living, and you're following your dreams, spreading all these beautiful words all over the world. That is amazing. So what would you say to someone who wants to write poetry or do the spoken word? What would you say to inspire them to tell them to follow their dreams? Um, read. First of all, read other artists, get to know the other artists in your city, um, not just in your city, like Google other artists. Figure out exactly what kind of poet you want to be because you can be a poet and not be a performer and you can be um, a performer and not be a page poet. Like there are different venues for your writing. So my first uh, advice is find out where you fit in. I'm big on people finding their lane. I think 
we all have ways to succeed out here and you should find the best way to succeed in this art form for you and what's best for everybody else is not necessarily best for you figure out what's best for you stick to it and do it to the best of your ability so with your with your poetry and your writing style what has been the most profound piece that you have ever written that you're like damn i wrote that um the poem from my father mm -hmm. uh, when i wrote 10 things they never tell you about the drug dealer's daughter um i actually wrote it on father's day mm -hmm. and it was a new poem and i was um, on a slam team for columbus ohio and i was pretty nervous about presenting my coach i had a very no nonsense coach mm -hmm. um and i was pretty nervous about presenting him a new poem this close to our competition but um, I really thought it was something I wanted to get off my chest, something I thought that should be heard. Um, and he allowed me to do it. He liked the poem and he had a lot of faith in the poem. And I did the poem at the competition and um, a group called Button Poetry put the poem online and the poem went viral and my career up started. It was such a quick experience. I went from, you know, trying very hard to get my name out there to finding my name on the internet, finding my name in the mouths of people who I respected for a long, long time. And it was to this day, not only one of my favorite poems, it's still one of the most difficult poems to record because it's the closest to my heart. So are we gonna hear that tonight on the Good Grief Tour? Absolutely, that yes. poem goes on every stage I remember. Oh wow, that's so dope, that's so dope. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Join us next Friday at 7 p.m. for Ready, Set, Flow.